we're talking about one of my favorite topics here, infrastructure. You know, it comes from the French. Uh, it was only uh, used for the first time, I think, sometime in the late 19th century. You know, it's one of my favorite topics because it's so boring, uh, but it's so important. Uh, and it also tends to stay in place. So if you can actually control it properly and develop it properly, it's a great area of, uh, of community wealth building, uh, both in the ownership sense and then in terms of uh, reducing costs for people. And uh, my name is Joel Rogers, by the way. I teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I direct COWS, the National Strategy, High Road Strategy Center. Uh, and I'm on the board of Emerald Cities. I'm one of the co-founders of Emerald Cities. I'm joined here immediately to my right is Darren, uh, or Devin uh, Lovas from NRDC, or Darren Lovas from NRDC. I should get these glasses out, I think. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Darren. Darren needs to pronounce Darren. Yeah, Darren. yeah, my goodness. <laughs> right. Uh, and to his right is Allison Corwin from CERDNA. Um, you know, the um, kick-ass foundation that, the ki that hits well above its, uh, its weight in terms of endowment in, in all this area. And then to her right is uh, Brian McGann from the Sustainability Business Council. So these are all people who've been thinking about these issues, know a lot about <coughs> infrastructure, and I want to just open it up. I don't know if, if I'm going to be successful in getting a real conversation going here, but let me just ask each of you to say something uh, of the sort, answering the questions that are raised in in the agenda about you know what what does this actually mean in terms of uh, uh, of infrastructure investments and the way that we're doing infrastructure so Darren want you to take sure. it away sure I can go ahead and get started I didn't know we had questions to answer that. I, I'm joking oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well we're, I mean we're, we're we face kind of an unenviable task where we have uh, um, trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure that we've laid out in this the built environment in this country a lot of which now uh, needs to be retrofitted in order to accommodate both slow uh, changes in precipitation and temperature uh, and, and that kind of thing, as well as extreme events uh, like, like we saw with Sandy, like we saw with Katrina. Um, so that's the bad news, is that we need a whole lot of investment here at a time when uh, uh, especially public resources seem constrained. The good news is that there are uh, relatively inexpensive uh, ways that we can uh, get ahead of this uh, and that's that's kind of what I wanted to, to focus on and I, I wanted to bring up uh, um, uh, three of them uh, first uh, um, uh, better performance management as well as data collection aggregation and, and presentation to the public uh, and this is where things are going fortunately in the transportation sector uh, in fact, um, right now out for comment from the administration is a, a, um, a proposed rule that would change metropolitan and state planning uh, and its connection with transportation improvement programs, which is how capital is actually investment, invested rather, by making it uh, performance driven as, uh, uh, as was kind of the mantra during the debate over the last transportation bill. So that rule is out for comment. I took a look at it uh, last night, and, and there's some pretty good stuff in there about really taking metropolitan and state planning to the next level, including to deal with resilience concerns and preparedness concerns when it comes to climate change. So that's the good news, is that if we get, get ahead of this by doing better planning, including by doing more scenario planning, which is encouraged as an option under federal law, and this, we need to basically do some rehearsals for what the future is going to look like. So do more scenario planning at the regional and state level in order to figure out what kind of futures we might face in terms of climate change. And then in the boring but important category, just like infrastructure, um, our data needs. Uh, we need a whole lot more data. And, and here there's also good news. The administration just came out with its national climate assessment. There's a transportation chapter. And they're really focused on working with uh, transit agencies, metropolitan areas, and states first to do pilot projects. There's a Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highway Administration set of pilot projects to actually do some planning, do some scenario building, and figure out uh, what data needs there are uh, to get ahead of what might happen under various climatic scenarios. Um, and that those, those activities are, are being done right now. That, I mean, really, the Department of Transportation, I think, is ahead of several other uh, government agencies when it comes to uh, looking at data needs and looking at planning needs. Uh, so the, the only two other things I wanted to mention, because I know we're short on time, is, is one, the increased use of partnerships. 
uh, um, which can reduce public costs for addressing uh, resilience needs. And here we see most recently uh, 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 Secretary Donovan announced the winners of the uh, uh, Rebuild by Design contest. Right. Right? Six different, project, different projects using Sandy recovery money distributed under CDBG disaster recovery, that, that particular pot of money. And that is almost a billion dollars, and it follows on the heels of uh, three and a half million dollars from the Rockefeller Foundation. So Rockefeller is putting up some philanthropic money that, that is helping to complement and leverage a lot more public money. So more partnerships with NGOs, and not just with philanthropies or with uh, nonprofits like mine, but with businesses is crucial as well. And I think Brian might get into that. I know that when Hurricane Irene hit Vermont, Google actually provided uh, a real-time mapping of what was happening around the state in terms of disaster effects for the citizens of Vermont. When the tsunami hit Japan, the big three automakers got together, and because the car fleet there, even more so than our fleet um, increasingly, I mean, they're basically computers on wheels in increasingly because of the advanced technology on them. They got together, opened up their data sets to the government of Tokyo uh, um, and the national government of Japan so that they could figure out what was happening with the transportation system, where bottlenecks were, where it looked like uh, infrastructure had broken down, and actually helped to speed the recovery process by opening up right. their data from all these cars. So those kind of partnerships can be crucial. And then the last thing I mentioned is social capital. Construction of, uh, or making sure that communities have decent social capital to recover from disasters and extreme events is gonna be crucial. And uh, there was an example of, of a Vietnamese community in New Orleans that recovered faster than most other communities because of how tightly knit the community was, right? And there's actually, Daniel Aldrich at Purdue University has studied several disaster events around the world and concluded that strong social capital, strong bonds, uh, not just within the community, but with outside elements who could help with recovery is crucial to recovery and that that, again, that's a lot cheaper than some of the infrastructure investments we're going to have to make. So. Right, albeit in so, so much short supply in some of our neighborhoods yeah. in America. Yeah, no, that's right, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. The other thing with the transportation, I agree with you on, on some of DOT's leadership. The problem is that almost all transportation money is actually spent at the state and local level, and that's controlled, you know, 97 cents out of every dollar on, trans, on surface transportation that we do is state and local. The federal role is relatively small, and those, those highway departments, as they still think of themselves largely in the <laughs> states, are you know, often quite dedicated to not doing <laughs> the right thing. Uh, we, we do a lot of work with them, some of them are lovely, but uh, it's a real problem. So in addition to all the other problems you have, we have this federal system with mm -hmm. incredible amounts of de devolved responsibility in a lot of these infrastructure areas uh, to states that are not exactly exemplary. So Brian, do you want to go next or you want to do Allison? Allison, you want to just go? Allison, yeah. Sure. I, I, th I thought you go wanted to line. end, but maybe not. Okay, great, so let's just go. Sure, uh, great. Joel, thanks for the great introduction. And Vicki, I just want to say thanks for your framing uh, comments and to Phil Thompson as well. Um, but I just want to say that last slide of Detroit looked a lot like the slide of Oz in the beginning. It, it was really striking. Um, I was also uh, really envious because you got like a jab in on your sibling there. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to have to figure out how to, how to do that in the future. But so thank you for the your comments. The one witness protection program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name is Allison Corwin. I work at the CERNA Foundation based in New York, but we work nationally. And I work on the Sustainable Environments team. And I guess you could say internally at the foundation, we're sort of trying to practice an ecosystem of resilience ourselves because we're trying to work cross programmatically across our three groups that we have. So. Um, for anyone who doesn't know CERNA, the mission is around building sustainable communities with a, a lens to equity and social justice issues. And so we have the sustainable environments team, and then we also have our strong local economies team and our thriving cultures team. And so we really try to strive to be really intentional about working in a collaborative way. So. Um, we have our own ecosystem going on there. But what we're looking at within the Sustainable Environments Group is we call it next generation infrastructure. And to both of your points about talking about infrastructure, you know, sometimes people's eyes glaze over. So you're, you're kind of starting from that, you know, that vantage point. But what we're talking about with next generation infrastructure is really this idea um, that most of the infrastructure in this country is 100, some of it's 200 years old, it's crumbling, it's failing us, it's outdated, we have fewer federal dollars coming down. Um, we're looking at situations where much of the planning that was done when this infrastructure was originally built 
was not an inclusive process, right? At its worst, it was really divisive and, and tore through communities, uh, particularly communities of color and low-income communities in a, in a really divided way, right? And so, and, and so when you look at all this and then you look at climate change and what that's doing to our infrastructure and what that's doing to our communities, we, we find ourselves at this point now at this crossroads, how could we reimagine infrastructure? How could it be something else? How could it provide multiple community benefits? How could it do all the things that we've been hearing all the speakers talk about this morning? How could it provide those multiple community benefits? And so we're about a year and a half into our implementation of, of our next generation infrastructure portfolio. So I thought I'd just take a minute to talk a little bit about what we see emerging, because my job is sort of to connect the dots across all the good work that everyone's doing across the country. So I just wanted to give a snapshot shot of kind of what I see going on right now. Really, it looks like the municipalities are really driving a lot of this innovation, and that makes sense, right? That's where climate impacts are being felt on the ground in these local communities, and you have the densest you know, populations living in cities. So that's where a lot of the innovation is coming from. But just to step back from that a moment, because I find myself talking a lot about the, the city piece, I just want to make sure I also mention what's happening at the federal level. So uh, a little bit has been talked, talked about this morning where, um, you know, we just saw the 111D rule, the decommissioning of the coal-fired um, power plants, right? And, and I think that's going to be uh, a game changer potentially. So you have the federal government playing a role there. I know uh, CAUSE has worked through the Mayor's Innovation Project on the stormwater rule with the EPA. That's, that's another big one. And I think uh, you had just mentioned HUD's rebuild by design. You know, you had $92 million there. Uh, the USDA has just put up some new money to try and connect rural and urban connections around food hubs. And, and I should actually back up, let me just say one other thing about my portfolio from a framing perspective. When I say infrastructure, we kind of are talking about four different buckets. So for us, we're talking about energy in the built environment, we're talking about uh, water management, mostly in urban areas, we're talking about food, Pretty much um, we're looking at food hubs and the infrastructure, so the aggregation and distribution of building back regional food systems, and then also transportation as it relates to equitable land use development patterns and transportation corridors. And for us, that sweet spot is where you see integrated solutions happening, so where energy is touching water and water is touching transportation and food is touching energy, you know, all of these things coming together, right? And then with an equity lens. So just for anyone who isn't familiar, just a, a framing piece there. So, so you have the federal government playing some role, I think, in those examples. But then I think what's also happening right now at the state level is you have governors who, who are saying, literally saying, infrastructure equals service equals quality of life, connecting those dots. And I think what's happening in the Northeast right now is kind of interesting because you have governors for the first time, the five Northeast states post-Sandy have actually ponied up new money, $135 million of state public money um, that's, they want to invest to mitigate sort of future damage because no one sort of wants to be left when the next storm hits saying they didn't try to do anything to mitigate sort of what happened after Sandy. So that's really pushing people on the state level. Um, but then you, what you have is you have this new money from the states, but you have communities that need to help figuring out how to access that money and how to implement it and who gets to benefit from that. And how do we make sure that those communities are actually in control of their energy futures? So there's this notion about energy democracy that um, I've been thinking a lot about. So I think a little bit was touched on about uh, the insurance, the role of the insurance agencies. Um, I won't go down that rabbit hole right now, I could, but um, I think the other big player, uh, the utilities, right? So then you have all this, who's feeling that pressure? The utilities, you have aging infrastructure, you have minimal to no load growth, right? And as that de decreases, you have falling revenues for these guys. So under the current regulations, also you have the intermittency, right, of renewables right now and the way that it's interplaying with the grid system, so wind and solar. And they're also thinking about cyber and, and data security issues. So you have all of these pressures coming down on them. And they're realizing that they can't do business as usual, but the regulations aren't set up to sort of let them innovate. So there's this whole conversation going on. And just in April, actually, the Public Service Commission in New York State issued what they call REV, Reforming the Energy Vision. So for anyone that isn't familiar with it, it's actually really interesting. They're the first state kind of all eyes are on New York State right now from this utility infrastructure perspective. They're the first state trying to go all in to figure out how to transform and go from a centralized grid system to a decentralized system. System. The thing that concerns me is that this shift means that they're looking at a market-based system. 
And in looking at a market-based system, there could be a scenario that plays out where you have some people that get basic service and then there's a fee for premium services, right? And so then you're going to have a real big equity issue because who's going to be left on that grid paying for the basic services and who's going to have access to these pre premium services? There's a lot going on that I could expand on if people are interested, but I think New York State is the early mover in that and the rest of the country, all the other utilities are watching to see how easy or difficult it is for them to implement a whole new business model. And this is their chance to sort of quote unquote get it right, but I think there's a big opportunity for the communities who want to control their energy futures to figure out what their energy needs are to make sure we get them to the table to talk about that. I guess what I would say, um, the last piece, just kind of going back to the municipalities driving innovation. This issue of making the invisible visible, anyone who talks to me knows I say that a lot. I see Diane smiling because I talk about that. That's a problem with infrastructure, right? Helping people understand sort of the context and, and the texture of infrastructure and how it touches their daily lives. And so we work a lot on communications as well and, and trying to figure out how to how to make this an issue that you can really talk about and feel and touch and see, right, outside of just these severe storm events and when it fails us. And so there are a lot of groups um, that we work with that represent sort of a network of cities. And so um, Center on Wisconsin Strategy, your Mayor's Innovation Project, I know Satya is here. You guys gather mayors and talk about some of these issues. Um, Emerald Cities Collaborative is another network of cities, right? The Urban Sustainability Directors Network is another. The Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities, um, NRDC's City Energy Project, I know. Uh, Living Cities, right? I could go on and on. And then there are all these certification systems that are trying to figure out how do you um, standardize some of these issues around resiliency. Um, and sustainability. So you have the STAR Community Rating Index, you have Eco Districts, you have things like Sustainable Jersey. I could rattle off a whole list, but the, the point being, and ACEEE actually, with your city and state energy scorecards, right? The idea is that you have these groups that are working across different places in these networks, and we need to figure out how to leverage those networks to get to some of the scale of the infrastructure solutions that we're talking about. So I'll, I'll end there and, and pass it on to Brian. Thanks. Um, well, uh, you know, I know one constituency that's very aware of, of uh, infrastructure is the business community, and it's it's vital to uh, having uh, a strong economies to having an effective uh, and reliable infrastructure system. I'm Brian McGannon with the American Sustainable Business Council. We are a policy organization based here in Washington. We are a council of business organizations and individual businesses that. Uh, throughout our network reaches about 200,000 small and medium-sized businesses across the country. Um, I'd like just to point out one of our member organizations, uh, uh, Chesapeake Sustainable Business Council uh, is here joining us. And those networks are, are invaluable um, to not only the state uh, and local uh, impact and policy making, um, but also contributing to what we do here at the national level. Um, and so before I even get into anything, I encourage uh, folks in this room to go to our website and identify uh, if there are partners in your localities to, to find these organizations and, and find opportunities because these are great companies. So our broader mission is to build a sustainable economy. Uh, so it, it, organization, it, it, we work on a variety of issues that are not just your traditional sustainability on energy and environment, but it ranges from campaign finance reform to sustainable agriculture. Uh, to uh, taxes and why ta I bring up taxes is because there's a lot of great thinking and a lot of great opportunity uh, in this uh, uh, space for infrastructure but we need to find the money in many cases to do this um, and so you know it, through our work we are trying to demonstrate that there's a link between all of these factors that we work on to build a sustainable economy it's not just one piece of this these all work together so uh, I'm going to talk through a couple of projects that we've uh, been involved with um, that, that where the business community is stepping up and demonstrating the need to raise awareness and a certain level uh, and, and are you know demonstrating the impact on the economies from extreme weather and the need for resiliency um, in South Carolina we've got a project called the South Carolina business uh, businesses acting on climate change um, it's a project of the coastal business community who are stepping up and putting something simple, just a piece of blue tape on their business uh, storefronts, demonstrating that uh, in the next 50 years and 100 years, this is where the water line is going to be. And if we don't start acting now, uh, either to find solutions <coughs> and mitigating the worst of climate change, 
this, you know, the, the resort industry and the, uh, the hospitality industry in the state, which is a huge piece of their economy, will be gone. Um, 51 million jobs, 200, uh, $2.8 trillion in wages and across the economy is in the hospitality and the coastal uh, region. This is a huge hit to the economy. Um, last year we worked on a report that uh, demonstrated the extreme weather impacts on, on uh, the business community. So, you know, the simple things are supply chain disruptions. Um, a lot of small businesses don't recover from major uh, uh, disasters. 25% of those don't, don't reopen following major disaster. The median cost of downtime for a small business affected by extreme weather is $3,000 a day. And most of those have really uh, you know, concentrated operations, whether they're one store or one warehouse. So if, you, if, that, goes out, if that goes out or is uh, put out of business, they you know, are, don't have the capacity like a major corporation to bounce back. Uh, a company in the, the uh, Navy Yards in New York, Ice Stone, was one of our business members who were uh, nearly wiped out in Sandy. They got an SBA loan to, to rebuild, but it was almost to the point of, of not reopening. So there's m incredible amount of impact. Um, and, and it's interesting that we've done some polling and have noticed that, um, you know, most the larger corporations um, are actually more aware and are actually taking larger steps, uh, even though they have more resources to adapt to these problems. Smaller businesses don't spend the time to think about these contingency plans and how do they re how are they going to react in uh, in case of a, a severe uh, 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 storm. So there's a lot of work to be done within the business community to raise awareness. Um, and then just one quick story, and I think Vermont's actually been this a, a, a nice theme that's been coming through here. Uh, one of our member companies, the seventh generation. Um, and they've got this in very compelling story everywhere they go when they talk about climate. As they say, Irene came in, it, it, the, the floods had wiped out uh, their, their region um, and it di disrupted their business pr uh, in Burlington. And there was a 20% hit to the bottom line that year and they accounted for it as a, you know, unusual uh, impact on the business. The next year, maybe I'm getting this out of order, but the, another was in Sandy, they have a major distribution center in New Jersey knocked out. Another 20% hit in that year's financials as a unusual accounting error. Then a, one of these uh, massive storms in Southeast Asia knocked out one of this, their primary sources of raw materials for their products. Third year in a row with 20% hit to their bottom line. So, you know, you know, a company that's already doing the right thing by having sustainable products and having an incredible mission, nobody's immune and it's a incredible um, impact across uh, all facets of the business. So one of the interesting things that we work on um, and what I think sets our organization apart in the business community is that our members realize that good regulations do lead to good outcomes. A lot of the business community will say regulations kill jobs, it's going to stop everything. You'd be surprised at a lot more Small businesses actually believe that these are good things. So I think when we have building codes, there's opportunities for to get the business community to, to stand with the resilient uh, development and all the, the great things we're talking about today. Um, there's you know, a thing called the Strong Act in Congress, which is an opportunity to start uh, get the federal government to work with state and local governments to build uh, can, uh, resiliency plans. And of course, uh, most importantly, you know, businesses have to reduce their carbon footprint um, to be part of the solution. Um, and frankly, and I don't probably have to tell you guys this, the best place to make an impact is at the local level. It's certainly not going to come from Washington. Um, but um, I, I encourage you to connect with the ASBC, uh, our website's ASBCouncil.org, uh, and find a local partner. You contact me, we can put you in touch. Do you list the actual members on the website? Yep. You do. Yep. So I go on Wisconsin and see everyone who yep. belongs so, to you. So Wisconsin. Wisconsin Business Alliance just joined us oh, yeah. within the last month. So right, right, right. Thrilled yeah. to happen. Was involved in starting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Terrific. Uh, Allison, I wonder if you could go down the rabbit hole just a little bit on insurance. Um, <laughs> 
know, oh, I thought I skipped past me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, everyone would sure. like to be insured against uh, all these disasters. Uh, the insurance companies don't want to do that. They're walking away from insurance all over. How do you see us insuring? Uh, how do you see the money uh, just on disaster relief going? Well, I mean, that's a big question. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. But I guess what I could say, and probably many of you in the room also have good things to say about this. But I think you, you, what you see... What you see is, you know, that sort of same thing that's going on with the utilities. The pressure is coming down. You can't do business as usual. It's costing the bottom line. There's got to be another better way to do this, and that's getting out in front of things, right? Um, and and I think particularly I've been looking at this around um, urban flooding and as it relates to green infrastructure as a solution. So you see insurance companies sort of coming to the table in an interesting way on the solution side, but also I think trying to figure out how to how to work with companies and create new new revenue and money. And so Ceres out of Boston is doing actually a lot of good work in thinking about the insurance industry. Interestingly, most of the sort of green bonds, I'm calling them loosely in quotes, that, that have been generated um, have been outside of the US. Very few have sort of um, been generated within the US or used. So just from a global perspective, more is sort of happening outside the US on, on that piece. I guess my concern, and, and I don't mean to conflate some of the financing issues with the insurance issues, but some of my concern is around standardization, um, equity issues around who's getting insured, at, you know, outdated systems like FEMA flood maps, and you know, right. there are so right. many issues going on here. Um, but my concern is a lot around the standardization of, of these things as they get rolled out. What gets to be called a green bond, you know, as it relates to the sort of larger financing industry, and um, you know. Yeah, I don't know if you want to. Here. Why don't you descri describe what you mean by a green bond? Well, that's actually, you know, lots of people mean different things. I think that's the problem. No one has defined exactly what that means, and there aren't criteria in place that say well, you what, get to, you get you to use roughly? this money. What do you uh, mean roughly? And we just say more of it's going on. Outside. I don't know if I should be the one. It should be the one defining what a green bond is. But you know, I think in general, if it were up to me, you know, it'd be it'd be used for things that we're talking about here today: next generation infrastructure solutions and these things around resiliency. My fear is that without standards in place, uh -huh. um, you know, there will be some greenwashing around how some of these funds get used, and we won't have criteria about what it means, and there won't be equitable standards about who gets to benefit from these things. And so I think that's also was getting to my point around the utility models. You know, as many of these different sectors are feeling the pressure of failing infrastructure, they can't do business as usual, right? And so there are these new models that are going to be happening, and they're, they're coming from all different forms. Um, I talked a little bit about the regulatory framework within the utility industry. I think a lot of our concern and attention is going to be is going to be on, um, you know, making sure that those benefits are borne in an equitable way, you know, and, and who's bearing the cost of these new systems that, that are coming into play. So that's a, that's a general answer, but right. yeah. Okay. So Brian or Darren, uh, how do you see this stuff getting paid for finally? Um, are we going to finally get taxes in America or are we going to have an endless series of uh, ridiculous P3s and toll roads everywhere? <laughs> how, how, where are we going to find the money? Well, I, 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 I think, um, I, I know some of the stuff can be done fairly cheaply, but uh, outside, of, if when you get beyond the federal level, there are there are actually revenues being generated for at least transportation programs. Uh, Twenty-two states so far has stepped forward with uh, increases to sales taxes, even gas taxes, yeah. and other mechanisms for mm -hmm. actually funding their programs. A friend of mine who runs a planning program uh, for the uh, Transportation Department of Maryland told me, you know, we're not waiting on the feds anymore, uh, and I think. An increasing number of states are going to do that. And then cities and counties have been raising a lot of money at the ballot box, right, for different transportation initiatives. I think we're going to see an increase in funding from localities and states, which is may not be optimal. I mean, you certainly want a, a, a sizable federal role, especially as we need to retrofit so much infrastructure moving forward. But I think that's the reality. And I also think we're going to see, we are going to see more P3s. And the question is, do those P3s rise above just being transactions, right, uh, um, that, that may not be in the public benefit to uh, ones that are actually where the contracts are put together with an eye on public benefits and involve, you know, they're put together in, in partnership with nonprofits and with communities. So they actually rise, again, transcend the level of just being transactions. Because I, I, you're going to need more private sector funding to right. come into this. Mm -hmm. so. For things that are currently largely controlled by the private sector, say communications or, uh, mm -hmm. or electricity or power, 
Do you see any increase in public role, or do you think it's just going to take the form of some sort of regulatory stuff and fighting it out on the equity stuff? Because in the same way, you're, you were talking about the electricity being yeah. provided different levels of service. Mm -hmm. You know, we've already seen that in communications. Verizon has walked away, I and mean, most of the most of the telephone companies have walked away from the commitments they made on, you know, on the cable and other things that mm -hmm. they were were parts of their settlement. Um, like in New York, for example, and there are whole sections of New York now that that don't have you know direct telephone service. It's only wireless. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you, uh, what's your read on the politics in those, in those two areas in particular, in terms of increased public role? I'm, I wouldn't be optimistic that, that there would be a, uh, a, a, a public role in those, just in our current political environment. I think that, you know, just the, the stalemate in Washington is just not a productive place to, to make that happen. You have so much money in politics, uh, especially the entrenched interests really do have, um, you know, not, I wouldn't I dare, wouldn't say a monopoly because then I would not be doing my job, but uh, a near monopoly. I mean, it, my favorite saying in Washington is a lot of money goes a long way. So for every one of me advocating uh, <laughs> on Capitol Hill and at the agencies, there are uh, 25 people from, whether it's the American Chemistry Council or the Telecom Association or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, right? So these guys are incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, they can affect decisions out in the states and put pressure. So uh, I think realistically, in the near term, unless there's a you know concerted movement like a ballot initiative where you know, the, the individual voters, the public will is more you know directly demonstrated uh, than at least from the federal level to, mm -hmm. to find either funding for or. Um, you know, some uh, interest in the public will. And uh, at least on the funding piece, too, we, we know where, you know, there is funding, where there's offshore tax havens, that loop, tax loopholes that we work on quite a bit. There's a ton of money, but there's not a lot of political will to make it happen. Right, so we're looking for a happy ending here. We should go see a Disney movie or something. <laughs> well, but, but with yeah. u utilities, I do think that, that there's mm -hmm. interesting change in the offering moving forward mm -hmm. because of the New York experiment, because of what's happening with renewables and efficiency because of the new uh, clean power plan. Um, it, it's going to be really inter interesting to see what public utility commissions do and what happens with utilities and their business model moving forward. Because mm -hmm. things are, the regulatory and policy framework around them uh, and the, the business framework is changing uh, um, and, and they're going to have to adapt um, uh, uh, over time. And that's where I see, could, uh, that's where I think you could see a, a stronger public role actually driving that in a constructive direction. Right, because it, it may not be a rate-based system going forward, right, depending right. on what happens mm -hmm. in New York. And yep. right. I, I just, just to add to this for one second, I think there's also a really interesting conversation happening around, and Kevin in the back can speak better to this than I can, but around uh, municipal bond finance and sort of how, how cities are getting really savvy about using their things, you know, old tools that have been around forever, like municipal bonds and credit enhancements and all of these things, and trying to drive them in a new direction towards some of these solutions we're talking about. Because as finances are tight, they're trying to get savvy about how do we use that. And then I think there's also this interesting conversation to pay attention to that's happening in a couple places. Detroit sort of, I think, started some of this. But the idea that cities could kind of band together and do some collective bargaining around some of the deals that they're getting, right? And so I think that we might so see... The Stephen Lerner type stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think we might see going forward some uh, cities getting really sharp about banding together and doing some collective bargaining around their municipal yeah. finance. They're certainly taking more stuff in in house now, which is good. So cutting out the banks a little bit. They yeah. Them on the fees. Yeah. So thanks to all of you. This, this discussion can go on a long way. Yeah. Yeah. You're great. Thank you so much.